we are ready to go. So, um, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to start our uh, look at uh, chapter 8. And chapter 8 is now where we get into, for the first time, uh, psychology situations, experimental situations, data situations that you will probably encounter uh, as your work um, in psychology. So this is where it gets real. This is where we do the actual techniques. We're going to use actual uh, procedures where we are no longer going to need to make assumptions that are highly unlikely. So we're no longer going to have to say things like, oh, well, we know the characteristics of the population, or we have access to information that we normally wouldn't have access to. Uh, now we get into the real situations where we're dealing with uh, the actual types of studies that a psychologist would do in the real world. So there are two types of situations that we're going to introduce here in Chapter 8. Uh, there is the single sample t-test and dependent means t-test. We're going to start off today with just a single sample. We're going, we're going to go into the dependent means next time. And uh, now that we have the entire five point uh, or five step uh, procedure down, now that you know how to do every single step of those procedures, uh, you're ready to do it all alone. But uh, more importantly, you are now ready to do it uh, not just alone, but actually also for real. So now we're going to take a look at situations, like I said, where you know what it is that you're doing, what it is that uh, we are uh, encountering. You have all the steps. Now we're going to apply it to actual real situations that are very common in uh, psychology. So we're finally getting to that super cool ninja stuff skills that we were talking about uh, at the beginning of the semester where I kept saying, you know, eventually we'll get to that part where we're doing the really cool stuff, the stuff that statistics is really uh, great for psychology. Today is the day that we get that all started. So we are going to start this by revisiting a study that we've already looked at, but this time we're going to do it in the actual realistic manner. This time we're going to do it in the manner that Harlow and his associates would actually have analyzed the data this time we're going to go in not knowing anything about the monkey population. So we're no longer going to have to make those assumptions and not having to know anything about a population opens up psychology to every population because it doesn't matter if you don't know what a population is like, you can still do psychology on it using the skills we're going to look at today. All right, so what are we going to encounter today specifically? Well, first we're going to have a little bit of foreshadowing in terms of uh, what is coming up, a very important change in our course. Uh, then we're going to take a very brief um, recap of hypothesis testing. We're going to introduce a t-statistic, which is an alternative to the z-statistic that we've been using. And it is so close to a z-statistic, it's kind of a blink and you'll miss the difference uh, situation. And then we're going to go through a hypothesis test with the T statistic. All right, so first the foreshadowing. So we are getting to the point now where the psychology hypothesis test that we're going to be doing are going to get a little bit more complicated. And by that, I don't mean that the five steps are going to change at all. It's still going to be the same five step procedure that we've been using before. But the mathematics involved are going to get substantially more uh, involved. They're going to get substantially more complicated. There's way more steps uh, mathematically. So this is a good time in this course to turn the math over to a dedicated statistics program that can handle these mathematical calculations with ease. It's time for SPSS. So what SPSS is, it's a dedicated statistical software program. Uh, it is basically us handing over everything that we're horrible as, um, at, as humans to the machines and then doing what we're good at uh, with that particular output. So what we're going to do is we're going to shift away from doing the math, doing the calculations, uh, taking out your calculator, going into Excel and using all the formulas. 
We're going to shift away from that and we're going to give that to the software package to perform because that's what a software package is made for. And then our job is going to be first to recognize the experimental situation and format the data correctly so that we can enter it into the software. And then afterwards to read the output that the software has given us and make sense of it. So that's where we're going to shift from. We're going to shift from actually doing the calculations to setting it up for a program, letting it do the calculations, and then correctly interpreting the output. So that's coming up uh, very shortly. I would highly, highly recommend do not miss, I believe it's next class, is where we're going to introduce SPSS. So do not miss next class. If you're watching this uh, on the YouTube channels, do not skip the next uh, video because I'm assuming that nobody has uh, used SPSS before. So we're going to start from the beginning of it. We're going to show you how to open the program, how to uh, open a file, all those sorts of basics, how to enter the data into SPSS. And then once we have that first class, we're going to be off and running with SPSS. So if you missed that class, uh, prepare to be very confused in terms of what's going on. Next class is very important. That's where we're going to introduce SPSS. All right, so that's my for, uh, foreshadowing. Now let's take a step back and take a look at hypothesis testing before. So previously when we were hypothesis testing, we were dealing with a very artificial situation where we knew the population that we were dealing with. We knew what the mean of the population was, we knew what the standard deviation of the population was, and from that we could make our comparison distribution. We could figure out that the mean of our comparison distribution is the same mean as our population. The standard deviation of our comparison distribution is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the size of the sample. That's what we went over last time. And then we take our sample that we treated and we simply ask, what's the probability that that sample came from that comparison distribution? And we set up our cutoff scores uh, uh, based on our alpha levels and we decided that if the sample came from the body of the distribution, if it did not cross over into those critical areas, if it did not cross over those cutoff scores, that we would accept the null hypothesis and say that the treated sample belongs to the old population. But if it moved into the, into the tails, then we would say that it is highly unlikely to have come from that old population. It must now belong to a new population uh, and we would accept the research hypothesis our treatment had an effect. All of this required that we know the population parameters. All of it required that we know what the mean of the population is and what the standard deviation of the population is. And that's what allowed us to calculate our z-scores. That's what allowed us to calculate our comparison distribution and then by that comparison distribution get a z-score for our sample that we no longer are going to have access to. So now we're going to change it into a situation that is much more realistic and that is where we don't know what the population is and it's just a hypothesized population. So this hypothesized population, what does that actually uh, mean? So once again, this is the artificial situation that we were dealing with up until now so we can learn hypothesis testing. This is the first realistic situation where we have an unknown population where we have a hypothesized mean but an unknown standard deviation and we're going to see exactly what that uh, entails. So what do we mean by a, by a hypothesized mean for our population? Well the first thing that we know is that it's an unknown mean. So we don't know what the actual mean is but we're able to come up with a hypothesized mean. And the hypothesized mean is what would be true of this population if the null hypothesis was correct. If the null hypothesis was true, what would we know about that population? So this hypothesized population is based on the null hypothesis. What would this population be like if the null hypothesis was true? And a great example of this comes from the uh, gender gap uh, in uh, salaries. So the gender pay gap 
We see a uh, graph here, uh, 59 cents on the dollar in 1970, 2016, 79 cents uh, on the dollar. Uh, the actual amount of the gender pay gap is very difficult to calculate. Depending on how you calculate it, it could be as high as 50% uh, uh, disparity, it could be as low as 1% disparity. So what the actual gender pay gap is in our population is unknown. We do not know what it is. Is it 50%, is it 1%, is it somewhere in between? But what we do know is that if the null hypothesis was true, if there was no gender pay gap, then we know what that population would look like. We know that the hypothesized population where there was no gender pay gap would look like this. So we might not know what the actual situation is in the population, but we know what our null hypothesis looks like. And that's what we mean by a hypothesized mean. We know that if there was no gender pay gap, the percent difference would be zero. Now, whether or not it actually is that, we don't know. But we do know that if it was true that there was no difference, the difference would be zero. So that's what we mean by that hypothesized mean. So up here for our unknown population, we don't actually know what the mean of this population is. But we do know that if the null hypothesis was true, it would have a certain mean. So that hypothesized mean is the mean if the null hypothesis was true. So we have the mean if the null hypothesis is true, but importantly, we do not have that standard deviation. So we might know where the mean is, but we don't know what the spread is. We don't know how spread out this population is. Because of that, we can't actually calculate a z-score. Because look what the z-score needs. The z-score needs that standard deviation. That standard deviation is unknown. That means goodbye z-score. Goodbye z-score means goodbye hypothesis testing. Goodbye hypothesis testing means goodbye psychology, which is something we cannot allow. So what do statisticians do? Well, they said we can't use the z-score. The z-score is done. So what we're going to do is we're going to make an alternative to the z-score. We're going to come up with another z-score-like statistic, and that was the t-statistic. So the t-statistic is what we're going to use moving forward. And this is for an unknown population, this first situation where the mean is hypothesized and the standard deviation is unknown. So that's the real life situation we're dealing with. And you cannot directly in that situation calculate the distribution of sample means because you need to have that unknown standard deviation. And we don't have the unknown standard deviation, so we cannot calculate that distribution of sample means. So that means that we can't do a lot of what it is that we would normally do if it wasn't for this other statistic. So the T statistic comes in and it's going to substitute, stand in for the Z statistic. Now thankfully, with this change, uh, we're not going to have to make any changes or very many changes to our five steps. So the five steps are going to stay the five steps, and this is going to be a common theme for the rest of the semester. The five steps will be the five steps. We're going to have to make some small little tweaks as we go along, but for the most part, they're going to stay the same every single time we encounter a new situation. So for example, restating the uh, question as a research hypothesis and a null hypothesis about the population. Step one. Step one does not change. Everything that you know about stating a null hypothesis and a research hypothesis, that has not changed in the slightest. That is exactly the same as before. Step two, determine the characteristics of your comparison distribution. This is the, actually the big change that we're going to go through. So we're no longer going to have our comparison distribution being uh, that z-score, uh, sorry, the distribution of z-scores that we were using before we're going to have a new distribution. So this is going to be the part that changes. Step three, determining the cutoff sample score on the comparison distribution. Determining your lines in the sand, how big your tails are. This is also going to change. It changes because we've changed our comparison distribution. So we change your comparison distribution, you change how you find your lines in the sand. Specifically, uh, you're going to have to flip 
to Appendix A2 instead of Appendix A1. And that is literally the bulk of the changes that you're going to encounter. Step four, determining your sample score on the comparison distribution. This is a slight change. This is a blink and you'll miss it change. So it's pretty much business as usual. You're going to see that the t-statistic that we're going to be calculating is very much like the z-statistic that we've been using so far. And then finally, five, decide whether to accept or reject uh, your null hypothesis. Uh, this does not change either. So this is going to be exactly the same as before, where uh, the same logic, the same, you know, if you make it into the cutoff score, uh, if you cross that line, you reject the null hypothesis, all of that remains exactly the same. All right, so let's start taking a look at those changes. So we got no change to number one, step number one. We got no change to step number five. Step two, we have our first change. This is determining the characteristics of the comparison distribution. So we don't have our standard deviation from our population. So what do we do? Well, we do what we've been doing all along, which is if we don't know something about the population, we use the sample to estimate that parameter. We use the sample to estimate something about the population. And that's what we're going to do. We don't know what the population variability is. We don't know what the variance is. So we have a sample sitting around from that population. We're going to use the sample variance. So population variance was defined as the sum of square deviations divided by the size of your population. Population standard deviation, sum of square, uh, sorry, the um, uh, population standard deviation was the square root of that variance. This is review from uh, chapter two. Sample variance, sum of square deviations divided by the size of your sample minus one. Remember it has that correction. And that correction is going to come up later. That correction is called degrees of freedom. And that is what we're going to be using instead of the population variance. So degrees of freedom is the size of your sample minus one. And that's something that's going to pop up over and over and over again uh, in the coming weeks. So we'll explain exactly how degrees of freedom work by a analogy of choosing food at a barbecue. All right, so let's say that you and your four friends go to a barbecue. And there are five things that are left to eat at that barbecue. Let's say that you got there late and there's five things that are left. And the first thing is a hot dog. And the second thing is a hamburger. And the third thing is uh, a taco. And the fourth thing is corn on the cob. And the final thing is bland potato salad. All right, so those are the five things that you have. And you and your four friends show up and you start making your choices. So the first person goes up there. Remember, there are five people, right? Five people in this sample. So the first person goes up there and note that they have freedom of choice. They can go up there and say, you know what? All of this looks good, but I am in the mood for a taco. So I'm gonna grab that taco. I have freedom of choice. I've chosen what I wanted, freedom of choice. That's one degree of freedom. The next person out of five comes up. They also have freedom of choice. They say, you know what? I am in the mood for that hamburger. Two degrees of freedom. Two people were able to make a choice. Next person comes up and they say, you know what, I, I love corn on the cob. I'm going to choose corn on the cob. Three out of the five had freedom to choose. Three degrees of freedom. Fourth person comes up. Person says, you know what, hot dog sounds wonderful right now. Fourth person comes up out of five, four degrees of freedom. That last person has no degree of freedom. They have no freedom. They are left over with the bland potato salad. So out of five people, there was four degrees of freedom in this situation. Same thing in statistics. Out of the size of your sample, everybody basically gets a choice minus one person, except for one person. So if you have five people, like in this situation here, you have four degrees of freedom. If you have 10 individuals who can make 10 choices, you have 10 minus one, 
nine degrees of freedom. So that's where degrees of freedom comes in. Uh, and as we're going to see, it plays a part in reading the uh, T distribution table. All right, so we're using sample variance instead of population variance uh, to do our comparison distribution. So we are going to just, again, calculate a comparison distribution just like we've been doing, but instead of using the population standard deviation, we're going to use the sample standard deviation. Instead of knowing the actual standard deviation, we have an estimated standard deviation. So when we calculate the spread of our comparison distribution, instead of having the actual spread, aka the standard error, we now have the estimated standard error. So that estimated standard error is simply your, sorry, it used to be, the real standard error used to be your population standard deviation, right there, divided by the square root of the size of your sample. This is what we just saw last class. You want to calculate the standard deviation of your comparison distribution? You take your standard deviation for your population and divide it by the square root of the size of your sample. We can no longer do that because we don't have the standard deviation of our population. So instead, we calculate estimated standard error. An estimated standard error is the standard deviation of your sample, which is being used to estimate the standard deviation of your population, still divided by the square root of the size of your sample. So it works exactly the same except we're substituting the sample standard deviation for the population standard deviation. So everything we learned in chapter six still remains. It's just that instead of using the population standard deviation, we substitute in what we have, the sample standard deviation. All right, so that's step two, our comparison distribution. Step three, determining your cutoff scores. This changes as well. And it changes because we've changed our comparison distribution. So now, instead of having a Z distribution, we have a T distribution. So this is the distribution that we were working with before. This is your Z distribution. And a T distribution looks a lot like a Z distribution, but there's two big differences between them. Number one, so there's your T distribution. First thing about a T distribution is that it has more area in the tails. All right, so it's got it's it's thicker on the outside. It's got more curves than a, than a Z distribution, however you want to phrase it. It's got more of its distribution in the tails, uh, a T distribution, compared to your Z distribution. So that's the first difference. The second difference in a T distribution is that the shape of it changes as your uh, sample size uh, increases. So it actually, whereas the Z distribution stayed the same shape, but just got squeezed in a little bit as you went higher and higher in terms of your uh, size of your sample, your T distribution uh, changes its shape as well. It not only gets squeezed in, but it also changes its shape as your sample size gets larger and larger. So this is what a T distribution looks like for one degree of freedom. That's a sample size of two. Two minus one is your one degree of freedom. So for one degree of freedom, that's what your T distribution looks like. There it is for two degrees of freedom. Sample size of three, two degrees of freedom. There it is for three degrees of freedom, four degrees, five degrees of freedom. There it is for a sample size of 11, which gives you 10 degrees of freedom. There it is for a sample size of 21, giving you 20 degrees of freedom. And as you can see, it basically becomes a Z distribution as your sample size increases. So your T distribution is different from your Z distribution. Number one, it's got more area in the tails. And number two, the actual shape of it doesn't just get squeezed, the actual shape of it changes as your sample size increases. All right, so that's the T distribution. That is our new comparison distribution. And it's our new comparison distribution because we don't know the actual standard deviation of the population. We're estimating it with the sample standard deviation 
for our population. So we have this new distribution. What that means is that we can't use the old table. We now have a new table of values that we need to access. This is your T distribution table. And we're going to see how to read that when we look at our example today. All right, step number four, determining your sample score on the comparison distribution. This is a very slight change. As I said before, this is your blink and you will miss it change. So your T statistic, the formula for your T statistic is right there. It is the mean, your sample mean, minus your comparison distribution mean, divided by the standard deviation of your comparison distribution. If you remember the z-score is your sample mean minus your comparison distribution mean divided by the standard deviation of your comparison distribution. It's exactly the same structure. It's almost exactly the same formula. The only difference is that instead of dividing by the actual comparison distribution standard deviation, we're dividing by the estimated comparison distribution standard deviation. And this change is what changes a z-score into a t-statistic. T so it changes this z-statistic into this t-statistic, but it's literally the same step just using the sample standard deviation to calculate that estimated uh, standard deviation. All right, so just to kind of show you the underlying, what is that uh, estimated standard deviation? What is that standard deviation of your comparison distribution? You'll notice again that the top part is exactly the same. So what you were doing with your Z statistic before is exactly the same thing you're going to be doing with your T statistic. It's just that instead of using the known standard deviation of our population, we are now going to be using the estimated standard deviation based on our sample's standard deviation. All right, so once again, this is why we cannot use the Z distribution anymore. This is why we can't flip to table or appendix A1. We've got to now flip to appendix A2. Other than that, it is exactly the same procedure. So once again, we start with that hypothesized population. Hypothesized mean, unknown uh, standard deviation. Hypothesis based on the null hypothesis. We then uh, figure out our comparison distribution, which is now a T distribution of sample means with these parameters right there. And now we take our treated sample and we find what probability does that treated sample come from our comparison distribution. We set up our lines in the sand and if your, T, if your sample comes from the body, we accept the null hypothesis, we reject the research hypothesis, if the sample moves into the tails, then we accept our research hypothesis and we reject the null hypothesis. And moving into those tails, what that means is that it does not belong. This treated sample is so weird that we conclude that it does not belong to this hypothesized population. It must belong to a new population, some unknown treated population, uh, but definitely does not belong to the hypothesized population. All right, enough hypotheticals. Let's get some real numbers going here. So we're gonna revisit Harlow's monkey study. We're gonna revisit Harlow's attachment study that basically turned developmental psychology on its head. And uh, we're gonna take a look at a, the real situation that he would have been under. The real situation that he would have um, encountered where he did not know how long monkeys prefer to spend with the terry cloth mother, but he could hypothesize how long monkeys would spend with the terry cloth mother. All right, so let's uh, recap here real quick. In a classic study of infant attachment, Harlow 1959 placed infant monkeys in cages with two artificial surrogate mothers. One mother was made from bare wire, uh, wire mesh and contained a baby bottle from which the infants could feed. The other mother was made from soft terry cloth and did not provide any access to food. Harlow observed the infant monkeys and recorded how much time they spent per day with each mother. In a typical day, the infant spent a total of 18 hours clinging to one of the two mothers. If there was no preference between the two, you would expect the time to be divided evenly with an average of nine hours for each of the mothers. That is your hypothesized population. 
So because Harlow was able to observe these monkeys, he knew that these monkeys spent 18 hours a day clinging to one of the two mothers. Right? They had 18 hours of access to the two mothers. So he doesn't know how long the population of monkeys likes to spend with the terry cloth mother. He has no idea. Maybe they like to spend all 18 hours with the terry cloth mother in the real world. Maybe they only like to spend one hour with the terry cloth mother in the real world. He has no idea what the actual population numbers are, but he does know that if the null hypothesis is true, if it is the case that there is no preference and monkeys will spend 18 hours with the two mothers, if there is no preference, then logically they're going to spend nine hours with one mother and they're going to spend nine hours with the other mother. Right? This is the definition of no preference. So even though he doesn't know how much time they actually spend with the mothers, he knows that in a population with no preference, if the actual real monkey population has no preference, well then the average time they're going to spend with the terry cloth mother is going to be nine hours. So again, he doesn't know what the actual population is like, but he does know that the hypothesized population, if the null hypothesis is true, he knows that population should spend nine hours with the terry cloth mother, that's where this hypothesized uh, value of nine hours comes from. All right. However, the typical monkey spent around 15 hours per day with the terry cloth mother. So he measured how long they spent with the terry cloth mother, and lo and behold, he found out that his sample of nine monkeys spends 15 hours a day with the terry cloth mother. So let's suppose that he had those nine monkeys, and they actually spent 15.3 hours per day with the terry cloth mother, with a sum of square deviations of 216, uh, are these results sufficient to conclude that the monkey spent significantly more time with the mother than would be expected if there was no preference? That is, are these results weird enough so that when we transform this population into our comparison population, when we transform it into our distribution of sample means, our comparison population that has a mean of nine hours here, when we transform it into that comparison population, was our sample weird enough that it is extremely unlikely to still belong to this population that has no preference? It's a weird sample, either a really weird sample or real monkeys don't come from this population. So again, the idea is that, is our sample only possible if the nine monkeys came from the extreme side of our sample, making it a highly unlikely sample, or is it more likely the case that this is not the real situation, that they actually do prefer the terry cloth mother in the real world? All right, so that's what we're gonna be asking now. In a more realistic situation, we're gonna use a two-tail test of an alpha of 0.05. All right, so we go back to our five-step procedure. We're still going to be using the five-step procedure. So, restate the question as a research hypothesis and a null hypothesis about your population. This has not changed. We still want to know, is there a preference for the terry cloth mother or for the wire mesh mother? Our null hypothesis, sorry, our research hypothesis, we'll start with that. There is a preference for one of the mothers. There is an effect, right? There is this preference, there is a difference. So we write this out as the mean time spent with the terry cloth mother does not equal the mean time spent with the wire mesh mother. That is your research hypothesis. If that's the case, then these monkeys belong to a population that prefers one of the mothers, right? They belong to this unknown population here that prefers one of the mothers over the other. On the other hand, if the null hypothesis is true, and there is no preference for either mother, then we know that the time spent with the terry cloth mother would be the same as the time spent with the wire mesh mother. That's what no preference means. If that's the case, then they belong to our hypothesized population, 
the population based on the null hypothesis. And because we know that they spend 18 hours a day with the two mothers, if they belong to this no preference population, they should spend nine hours with each mother, therefore they should spend nine hours with the Terry Cloth mother. So that's our null hypothesis and our research hypothesis. Research hypothesis that there is a difference between the time spent with the two mothers. Null hypothesis, there is no difference in the time spent with the two mothers. All right, step two, determine the characteristics of the comparison distribution. This is uh, where we make a slight change. So the mean of your distribution of sample means, the mean of your comparison distribution stays the same. That is the same as the mean of your population. We determine that the mean of our hypothesized population is nine hours. That's why the mean of our distribution of sample means over here is also nine hours. Okay, so once again, if there's no preference between the two mothers, they'll spend nine hours with one mother, nine hours with another mother, that's where we get this nine hours. That's our comparison distribution's mean. The change now comes when we're taking a look at the, when we're taking a look at the uh, spread of our comparison distribution. What is the standard deviation of our comparison distribution? So to help figure this out, and to kind of give you an appreciation of why we're going to be introducing SPSS to start helping us out with some of these, we're going to go back to where Harlow would have to start, and that is calculating our sample variance. So we have all this data, we now need to calculate the variance for our sample first. So that equals the sum of square deviations divided by um, the size of your sample minus one. This is chapter two stuff going way, way back. That is equal to the sum of square deviations divided by your degrees of freedom. So remember, size of your sample number minus one equals degrees of freedom. Remember that barbecue situation, somebody had to eat that potato salad, they had no degree of freedom. All right, so from the question, 216 was the sum of square deviations. The size of our sample was nine. Nine minus one is our degrees of freedom. We crunch the numbers, we get a sample variance of 27. So this again is just review, this is chapter two, where you can see that we have to start with some pretty basic math, uh, even to begin what we're doing. So now we know the variance of our sample. That's the variance that's gonna stand in for this unknown population variance. So now we're ready to compute the estimated standard error. Now we're ready to try to compute this number here. How spread is our comparison distribution? So for that, we take the variance that we had divided by the size of our sample and take the square root of that whole equation. Uh, this is the way your textbook uh, does it. Basically, we've been doing the same thing, but just with standard deviation divided by the square root of the size of the sample. It's mathematically equivalent. We end up with, once we crunch those numbers, standard deviation of root three, and that's approximately 1.73. So that was what we needed to do to get this information here. This estimated standard error, the spread of our T distribution, the spread of our comparison distribution is 1.73. All right, step three, set a cutoff uh, sample score or critical value. This once again is the target against which you're going to compare your uh, your sample. This is these lines right here like we've been doing this whole time. So where are those lines? We need to figure that out. Well, unfortunately, uh, we now have, well, fortunately we have a t-distribution that we can look up. But much like our z-distribution, this distribution is nowhere in our textbook, right? This particular distribution with a mean of nine and a estimated standard error of 1.73, has a mean of nine, standard deviation of 1.73, this is nowhere in our, uh, in our textbook. So what we have to do is we have to change this one more time into a T distribution that has a mean of zero and has an estimated standard error of one. <coughs> 
This is in our textbook. This is in Appendix A2. And now we're going to find out where is our cutoff scores for this particular comparison distribution. So now we go to our new table. And you'll know the new table because it looks different. It does not look like our old table. So this new table is a little bit different because this is the first time that we have to take into account degrees of freedom. So that's why this table looks slightly different. We still have one-tailed and two-tailed tests. We still have different uh, um, amounts in the tails here, but now we got degrees of freedom. That added a wrinkle to this table. So how do we deal with this? Well, we need three pieces of information in order to find our cutoff scores, in order to find these numbers here that we're looking for. Three pieces of information, and you hone in on the correct score with those three pieces. So number one, is it a one-tailed test or is it a two-tailed test? So the question said, we're doing a two-tailed test. Our null and research hypothesis were for a two-tailed test. So we are here in the two-tailed test area of our uh, t-distribution appendix. Next thing we need to know, what are the degrees of freedom? We have a sample size of nine. Right? We had nine monkeys in our study. That's what that n meant, n equals nine. Degrees of freedom is nine minus one. We got eight degrees of freedom. So make sure that you're calculating your degrees of freedom. It's pretty straightforward in this case. It's uh, the number of uh, subjects minus one. That lets us know which row we're looking at. So we're looking at this row here, the eight degrees of freedom row. And then the last thing we need to know is in our two-tailed test, what was our alpha level? And that's what these numbers here are. So these, number, these numbers here is what is our alpha level. Was it an alpha level of 0.1? Was it an alpha level of 0.05? Or was it an alpha level of 0.01? What did the question say? Well, this question said alpha level of 0.05. So that's our last piece of information. The number where all of this intersects is 2.306. So this line here is 2.306. This line here is minus 2.306. And those are your lines in the sand. So once again, it works much like a z-distribution, just a new table. But the basic idea is the same. We needed those cutoff scores. We needed those lines in the sand. And this is the table now that you're flipping to in order to look up those lines in the sand. All right, so we got our cutoff scores. Uh, typically, when you report a T statistic and T cutoff scores, you have to report the degrees of freedom. That's what that 8 is there, because you remember 9 minus 1 equals 8. And that is, once again, we got two tailed, so we got plus 2.306, and we got minus 2.306. All right, step four. So from here on in, it's going to be pretty much business as usual, with a slight little change right now. Now we got to, instead of calculate our z-score for our sample, we got to calculate the t-score for our sample. Instead of figuring out where our sample was, where this sample of monkeys was on our uh, z, uh, I'm sorry, on our comparison distribution, we got to find out the t-score to find out where it is on our transformed distribution. So this means that we need to find where that 15.3 hours that our sample scored. Remember, our sample of nine monkeys spent on average 15.3 hours with the cherry cloth mother. We know that this is nine hours right here. Where is 15.3? We have no way of knowing on this distribution. So we gotta transform this using this comparison distribution into this t distribution here using the formula for a t statistic. And it's basically what you've been doing with the z statistic. We take the mean of the sample minus the mean of your comparison distribution divided by, this, by the uh, standard deviation of your comparison distribution. You plug all those numbers in, we get 3.64. That's where our sample is. So our sample of monkeys Again, we don't know exactly where it is here, because this is not in a table in our textbook. But here, we can find out where it is. 
because that's a mean of zero. This line here is a mean of 2.306. Sorry, this line here is a, a score of 2.306. So that's zero, that's one, that's two, that's 2.306, that's three, that's 3.6. Our monkeys are right there. That's where they ended up. Importantly, they crossed the line. This sample has crossed that line in the sand. The sample has gone into the tails. This right here is at 3.64 that we just calculated. All right, so finally, decide whether to accept or reject the null hypothesis. This logic is exactly the same as what we've been using so far. If the sample t-score is beyond your cutoff t-score, there's your sample t-score. Yes, indeed, it went beyond your cutoff t-score. So what do we do? We accept the research hypothesis and we reject the null hypothesis. We accept that there is a preference for one of the mothers. We reject that there is no preference. If, on the other hand, it was the opposite, where the sample t-score was within the cutoff t-score, if this sample mean ended up somewhere in the body here, well, then we would accept the null hypothesis. We would say there is no preference for either of the mothers, and we would reject the research hypothesis. So as it is, we've made our decision. Our sample score did go beyond our cutoff score. Our sample mean did end up in the uh, tail of our comparison distributions. We reject the null hypothesis, and we conclude that the monkeys actually do prefer the Terry Clock mother. Uh, they actually uh, do prefer to stay with the warm, cuddly mother rather than the mother that offers them food and sustenance. All right, so welcome to the real world. That is an actual real world uh, type situation where we had access to information that we would have in a real psychology experiment. We didn't know what the population actually was, but we knew what the hypothesis said the population would look like if there was no preference. We found out where our sample actually is, and we concluded that monkeys actually do prefer the soft, cuddly mother. And again, uh, if you're unfamiliar with Harlow's work, this opened up the entire area of attachment theory, and the idea is that uh, parents are more than just resource providers, food, shelter, and clothing, but it's actually very important to, support, to provide emotional support as well. All right, so we got uh, about 20 minutes left. Let's just wrap this up real quick. Uh, for homework assignment number one, so chapter eight is gonna have two parts to the homework assignment. First part is on this single sample uh, hypothesis test that we just did. The next part is on the dependent means hypothesis test. So you are now ready for part one, uh, what we've just gone through for the single sample test. So that's gonna be due uh, Monday by uh, midnight. And uh, as you probably encountered, but just uh, to kind of remind you about this, the pretests are going to get more challenging. So now as you go forward, the pretests are going to become, uh, they kind of ramp up in difficulty, I believe, because this area of statistics kind of ramps up uh, in how challenging it is. When we go over it in class, hopefully you will see that it's exactly what you've been doing before with one slight little change. So this procedure right here is exactly what you've been doing with z-scores and hypothesis testing before, except now instead of using z-scores, we're using t-scores. And t-scores look a lot like z-scores, but we have to make sure that we're using the t-scores, the t-statistic. Hopefully you'll notice that as we go through, we'll just use the same kind of procedure with one little tweak, one little tweak, one little tweak. However, I do know that the pretest can get kind of challenging. So, Take advantage of the MySat Lab um, study plan. Use those mastery points to bump up your grade, but definitely continue to do the pretests. Uh, even if you fail on the pretest, actually, if you check the res uh, if you check the research, especially if you fail on the pretest, it's doing a lot of work. So your pretest is kind of like your workout, uh, your mental workout to flex those muscles, build those muscles. And when somebody does a workout, they don't care if they don't do it perfectly. They know that putting in the effort is gonna pay off dividends. Keep that in mind as part of your training. Make sure that you're going through that. But at the same time, 
If and when you do fail, just know that you do have that MyStatLab study plan to back you up where you can earn those points so your grade doesn't suffer. All right, so we got about 15, uh, 20 minutes left uh, in class. That's what I wanted to cover for uh, today. So if that was enough, I know it was a lot. If that was enough for you today, uh, feel free to call it an early day. But uh, if you want to stick around, uh, call me over if you need assistance on anything, and I will help you out to make this transition to the real world uh, situations of hypothesis testing.